Hello world, you're watching Bit Wrangler, and today we'll be taking a look at the PIC microcontroller and we'll have a basic overview of its architecture. Now, why am I making this video? Most people getting into microcontrollers today will do so by buying a development board like the Arduino Uno. And the Arduino IDE comes with many libraries which will abstract away a lot of the usage of the underlying hardware, which is really great for beginners. And, you know, as a beginner, you really don't care about the hardware. You just want the microcontroller to handle some logic for you in your fun little project and that's been great for getting people involved with microcontrollers. However, some people eventually will want to take a deeper dive into embedded programming and in that process they'll run into projects where you really actually start having to know how the underlying hardware works and you may run into a brick wall there just because you you've been using all these user-friendly libraries for so long and you've gotten used to them and now all of a sudden there's this brick wall and to get past it you'll need to have some fundamental knowledge about the underlying hardware and that's where this video comes in it's there for people who want to have a deeper understanding of what's happening on the on a microcontroller, and in this case, it's going to be the PIC18F series of microcontrollers. So let's go over to the bench. Any microcontroller is going to have some sort of a CPU or a central processing unit on it. And coming out of this CPU, there will be some signal lines which will carry the address information and I'll explain what this means in a little bit and there's going to be some signals which will be used to control things and then you'll have a bunch of signal lines which will form a data bus which is going to take data in and out of the CPU. Now let's simplify this diagram just a little bit and what we're going to do is we're going to combine the individual signals into bus lines. So here we're going to have an address bus and then here we're going to have a data bus which will also carry the control signals. Now the purpose of the CPU is to execute instructions. A on its own, it's pretty much useless. So we're going to add some components onto our microcontroller to help, you know, improve the functionality. So the most common component that we'll add is some RAM or random access memory, which will hold which will be which will function as a little scratch pad for us performing some calculations and things like that so we'll connect that to the address and the data bus we may also want to interact with the outside world so we'll add some input and output peripheral to our microcontroller and then Finally, we, you know, just as an example, we may want to communicate with other devices using common protocols. So we'll add a UART peripheral right here. And it's connected once again to the address and the data line. Now, from the point of view of the CPU, Interacting with any of these peripherals involves some sort of an operation on a data address and then either a read or a write of data to it. So when we interact with anything on the microcontroller, 
it will be once again some sort of an operation and it will look as though we're reading or writing to memory now if depending on the architecture we may also have another set of address so another address bus here and another data bus here so we'll have another set of buses that would go to some sort of read-only memory ROM or flash memory and this ROM or flash memory will actually hold the instructions that the CPU will execute. This architecture right here that has two sets of address and data buses with one set going to different kinds of peripherals and the other set of buses going to the uh, memory holding the instructions is called Harvard architecture because it was invented at Harvard. And just as a random bit of information, the other common architecture that has uh, just a single set of address and data buses is known as Princeton architecture. Or really, I forgot its official name, but it was invented at Princeton. Now, one thing I'm not showing here on this diagram is there's also going to be some components on the microcontroller that are going to be used for debugging and programming the microcontroller. So it may connect something like this, and then this will go to the outside world. And that's actually how we're going to get our program into the flash or ROM memory on the microcontroller. Now that we're familiar with the PIC microcontroller architecture, we can start taking on a more programming-oriented point of view of the microcontroller. So instead of having a CPU and many different kinds of peripherals or other components on the microcontroller, we can instead look at it as there being a CPU and it having access to a bank of flash memory right here, flash memory, which is going to hold all the instructions for the CPU. And we're also going to have access from the CPU to a second bank of memory, which will actually represent all other peripherals on the microcontroller. Now, the memory is essentially a bunch of bins that hold a byte of data each. So the memory is going to have some sort of address like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. And then different address ranges in the memory are going to represent different components on the microcontroller. So for example, the read, uh, the random access memory. So here, RAM is going to have an address range of zero all the way include uh, up to three, including three. And then another peripheral, like the input and output peripheral, would get its own address range. So for example, if we keep going with the numbering here, five, six, seven, eight, let's say these two addresses, seven and eight, actually represent the input and output peripheral. Now, any instruction on the in the flash is going to be executed by the CPU. And typically that instruction is going to be doing something to the second bank of memory. And depending which address you access, that will, de uh, you know, that will determine what you're actually going to be 
doing with the interaction. Now, what happens when you turn on the microcontroller? First, it's going to go through some sort of configuration and boot up step. And I'm not going to go into too much detail about what happens here, but it basically turns on all the hardware, which isn't necessarily accessible directly from code. And then once the device has been properly booted up, it will then go to some location in memory, which is often known as the reset vector. So this reset vector is actually some address in memory. So on the PIC, the address is actually zero. So in our flash memory bank here, this is our flash, it's going to go to address zero, so the first address, and it's going to just start executing instructions. And so it goes to reset vector, and then three is execute. Exit, execute, right here. So once it starts executing, all it does is it just keeps following the instructions aside from any interrupts that may come in during execution. Originally, I wanted to have a section in this video about reading the data sheet and then actually by hand writing some hex files and then programming them onto the microcontroller. However, just the information, the very basic information about the architecture of the microcontroller has been making for a pretty long video. So I decided to skip the practical side of it, but I will most likely cover this in a future video. In the meantime, I would really appreciate it if you were to comment on this video. I'd like to learn what you liked about the video, what you didn't like about it. Uh, I'd like to know what you'd like to learn about and what kind of videos would you like to see next. So thank you very much for watching Bit Wrangler and have a fantastic day. Bye.